Section 1 of England Since Waterloo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1 Introductory Part 1 England emerged from the Great War the most powerful nation in the world compelled by the action of the french republic to take up arms in seventeen ninety three she had sustained the struggle almost without pause for a quarter of a century not seldom single-handed again and again she had been deserted by her allies again and again they had been encouraged partly by her liberal subsidies partly by her dogged resolution partly by her unbroken supremacy at sea to recombine to resist the domination of the new Charlemagne. Her steadfastness, courage, and endurance at last reaped the appropriate reward. Impotent to assail English power at sea, foiled in his attempt to ruin her commerce, baffled by the national spirit which he had himself aroused in Germany and Spain, overwhelmed under Russian snows, and finally conquered by the genius of Wellington, napoleon was at last driven into exile and europe was at peace the task of the soldiers ended that of the diplomatists began over the settlement which they effected at paris and vienna england naturally exercised a powerful influence her own material acquisitions seem however at first sight to be incommensurate with the sacrifices she had made in the common cause Russia reaped a rich harvest in Poland and on the Baltic littoral. Austria exchanged her embarrassing heritage in the Netherlands for much coveted provinces in northern Italy. Prussia underwent a territorial readjustment which definitely determined her political destiny. Sweden was partially consoled for her losses on the Baltic by the acquisition of Norway. The Dutch Stadtholder absorbed belgium and the king of sardinia annexed genoa compared with the substantial gains of her principal allies compensations obtained by great britain might appear inadequate in reality as will presently appear they were scarcely less pregnant with future possibilities than those of russia prussia or austria her attitude in the negotiations which preceded the peace was consistent with her unselfish activities throughout the war her first anxiety was to secure a settlement which should be at once equitable and permanent captious critics are apt to assume that neither result was actually attained it is commonly asserted that the diplomatists were inspired solely by the spirit of reaction that they ignored the new and vital forces generated during the last twenty years that they paid excessive deference to the convenience of rulers and too little to the rights of subjects that they were solicitous for the principle of equilibrium but careless as to that of nationality in fine that they erected a flimsy structure with unstable foundations criticism in the light of after events is easy the task of the diplomatists was exceptionally difficult their first and most obvious duty was to erect the strongest possible barrier against a recurrence of the devastating flood from which europe had so lately emerged it is not pretended that they were entirely successful the ill-assorted union of belgium and holland lasted only fifteen years the territorial partition of italy and the constitutional settlement of germany were not destined to much greater permanence but at least it may be claimed that the peace of Europe was not again seriously disturbed for more than a generation. Great Britain had not much personal interest in the territorial reconstruction in Europe. She retained the island of Malta as an additional guarantee for her naval supremacy in the Mediterranean. She accepted the protectorate of the Ionian Isles, which Bonaparte had intended to use as stepping stones to the east, in the northern seas she acquired heligoland and she employed her dominant influence to induce france to bind herself without loss of time 
to concert with the British government the most effectual measures for the entire and definitive abolition of a commerce so odious and so strongly condemned by the laws of religion and nature as the slave trade. For the rest, England sought her compensations further afield. British India, doubled in extent under the rule of Lord Wellesley, 1798 to 1805, was beginning to exert a powerful influence upon the policy of the homeland. The retention in 1815 of the Mauritius, of Ceylon, and above all of Cape Colony, was significant of this new influence. These acquisitions, although valuable in themselves, were primarily important as stages on the highway to India. The West Indies were, in 1815, regarded as hardly less important than the East, and not without reason. Out of a total exports of 58,624,550 pounds, no less than 7,218,057 pounds, or a little less than one-eighth, went to the West Indies. The retention, therefore, of Trinidad, Santa Lucia, Demerara, and Essequibo meant more than the present generation is wont to realize. Substantial in amount and significant in direction, as these acquisitions undoubtedly were, no one can pretend that they afforded excessive compensation for the sacrifices which Great Britain had made during the prolonged contest with France. To many they seemed ridiculously inadequate. But be this as it may, it is at least incontestable that the war left England with prestige enormously enhanced, with power unbroken and empire extended. These things were not bought without price. If England reached in 1815 the zenith of political and military prestige, she touched the nadir of industrial dislocation and social discontentment. That a great war is invariably followed by a period of economic recoil has become a commonplace of historical generalization. But the recoil of 1815 was unprecedentedly severe and unusually prolonged. For this, there are many reasons which will demand detailed investigation later on. For the moment, it must suffice summarily to point out that the period of the Great War was coincident with that of the Industrial Revolution. Thanks to a series of remarkable mechanical inventions, England, which had for centuries been a granary and a sheepfold, was suddenly transformed into the workshop of the world. Parallel to the manufacturing revolution and practically coincident with it, there had taken place in agricultural methods changes which revolutionized the rural economy of England. Down to the outbreak of the war, more than half the parishes in the country were cultivated on the open field system, and the results as regards aggregate yield were by general consent disastrous. During the reign of George III, no less than 3,200 enclosure acts were passed, and more than 6 million acres were enclosed. Improved methods of cultivation and stock breeding were introduced, farms were consolidated, capital was embarked in agriculture, and science was called in to reinforce the old rule of thumb. Thanks to this agricultural revolution, England was able not merely to feed a rapidly increasing population at home, but to export her produce to the continental countries rendered sterile and desolate by the ravages of war. Hardly less important than the revolution in manufacturing and agricultural methods was the immense development during the same period in means of communication. While Turnip Townsend and Coke of Holcomb, Elman of Glynde, Bakewell and Arthur Young multiplied a hundredfold the productiveness of the soil, while Kay and Hargreaves, Arkwright and Crompton, Cartwright and Watt revolutionized the textile industry. Brindley and the Duke of Bridgewater, Telford and Macadam, gave to labor and new mobility and facilitated enormously the exchange of commodities. Down to the accession of George III, 
England, in regard to means of transport, was the most backward country in Western Europe. The first Canal Act was not passed until 1755, and the roads were scandalously bad. At the date of the accession of Queen Victoria, England possessed 4,000 miles of navigable waterway. The trunk roads were improved out of recognition. Steam navigation had begun, and two lines of rail had been laid down. With the economic, social, and political results of these changes, this volume must be largely concerned. The stupendous increase of aggregate wealth, the rapid growth of population, and the significant changes in its distribution, the rise of new industries and the growth of cities, the development of means of communication, the expansion of oversea trade, these things suggest some at least of the clues which may enable the student to track the maze presented by the history of the nineteenth century for the historian of this period is confronted by a task different in kind from that which impedes the student of the middle ages he is baffled not by paucity but by redundance of material his function consequently is selective rather than accumulative it may be well, therefore, to indicate at the outset the more important lines of development upon which, in this complicated period, attention should be concentrated. The nineteenth century may be summarily described as the period of democracy and empire, science and industry. It witnessed a fourfold revolution, political, social, economic, and intellectual. From the political standpoint, the period falls naturally into three great divisions, corresponding to three striking changes in the center of political gravity. The years between 1815 and 1832 witnessed the close of the rule of the aristocratic oligarchy which had governed England, and in the main with conspicuous success, for a century and a half. The Reform Act of 1832 dethroned the landed aristocracy and committed supreme power to the commercial classes. The full effect of the change was not, however, discernible for a generation. Until the death of Lord Palmerston in 1865, England continued to be governed despite an extended franchise and a radical redistribution of constituencies by a knot of great families who had ruled it since 1688. But by 1865 the era of middle-class rule was itself drawing to an end. In 1867 a second shifting of the center of political gravity occurs. By Disraeli's famous Leap in the Dark, 1867, the mass of the town artisans were admitted to the parliamentary franchise. By Gladstone's Act of 1884, the same privilege was conferred upon the rural laborers. Again, however, it will be seen that a generation had to elapse before the newly enfranchised classes found their political feet and inaugurated the era of democracy. Not until the beginning of a new reign and a new century did political supremacy effectually pass from the bourgeoisie to the manual worker nor must the importance of the press and the platform in this connection be ignored. The growth of the democratic principle was not, however, confined to the imperial government of Great Britain. A similar development is observable in the local government of the motherland and in that of the more important colonies. The reform of municipal corporations in 1835 the reintroduction of the elective principle into county government in 1888 and into district and parish government in 1894 mark the main stages in the first case the attainment of responsible government by canada 1840 by the several australasian colonies 1850 to 1890 by the cape colony 1872 and by natal 1893, are the most important examples of the latter. 
the advent of democracy must therefore be regarded as one of the primary interests of the period under review hardly less significant is the shifting of the centre of social and economic gravity the act of 1832 administered the coup de grace to the political ascendancy of the landed gentry. The legislation of Sir Robert Peel between 1841 and 1846, combined with the immense development of facilities for transport, similarly put an end to their economic supremacy. Ascendancy passed from the owners of land to the owners of capital, as it is now in turn passing from the owners of capital to the possessors of business brains and skilled hands. Both changes are accurately reflected in the history of legislation. The owners of capital asked nothing of the state but abstention from interference, a fair field and freedom from restraint. But the philosophical ascendancy of Bentham, and the political supremacy of the manchester school were of comparatively short duration the introduction of machinery the supersession of the hand worker the development of the factory system the concentration of population in unregulated towns in a word the industrial revolution raised problems that were both new and puzzling to solve them the interference of the state was invoked and the result is seen in a long series of parliamentary statutes acts for the restraint and supervision of child labor and female labor in factories and workshops for the improvement of the sanitary conditions under which the poor live for the education of their children and for their own protection from accidents may be cited as characteristic illustrations of this tendency to the same industrial revolution we must look also for the genesis of new economic problems if as is claimed the revolution solved the problem of production it must be admitted that it accentuated if it did not create the problem of distribution so long as the household was largely self-sufficing so long as industry was organized on the domestic system so long as there was little differentiation of economic functions and the machinery of exchange was crude the problem of distribution was held in abeyance but when the landowner was parted from the capitalist the manufacturer from the farmer and both from the hand worker disputes naturally arose as to the share of the total product which each could equitably claim in such a contest the individual workman had little chance against the capitalist employer hence the necessity for the organization of labor and the initiation of collective bargaining until eighteen twenty four and in a modified degree until eighteen seventy one the law was steadily opposed to combination but economic pressure gradually wore down the resistance of legislative restraint and the legalization of trade unions forms one of the most significant chapters in the economic history of the nineteenth century trade unions however though effective as a palliative offer no permanent solution of the problem of distribution and no sound basis for industrial peace the cooperative movement has a wider scope the idea of cooperation was born in the fertile brain of robert owen but it was first embodied in successful experiment by a working-class society at rochdale in eighteen forty four as a distributive agency the cooperative movement has attained gigantic proportions and has proved an unqualified success but it has done more than provide the working classes with sound commodities at reasonable prices by its democratic system of control it has initiated thousands of working men into the mysteries of business management and has taught them the importance of the functions of capital by its automatic machinery for saving it has inculcated not merely the virtues but the possibilities of thrift but it has not solved and it cannot solve the problem of wealth distribution 
the same principle applied in a variety of forms to the difficult art of production has made a gallant effort in this direction it were idle to pretend that it has attained in this sphere a complete or even a very large measure of success there have been many experiments watched with sympathy by all who realize the gravity of the problem and many failures in the simpler form of profit-sharing some success has indeed been achieved and even in the more complex and elaborate form of labor co-partnership there has been more success than is commonly supposed but progress has unfortunately been retarded by the singular reluctance of co-operators to recognize the market value of business brains signs are not wanting that lessons learnt in the hard school of experience are being taken to heart that co-operators are beginning to appreciate the increasingly important part which direction plays in modern industry and to face the fact that efficient direction cannot be obtained unless the market price is paid as soon as this truth permeates the cooperative body we may look for rapid progress in the domain of production thus far the recognition of the economic importance of the entrepreneur has been tardy and meanwhile a third solution of the problem has obtained increased support among the working classes of this as of other countries robert owen was the father not only of cooperation but of english socialism the modern socialist however impatiently brushes aside both cooperation and trade unionism as mere palliatives in his view the panacea for all social and economic ills is to be found in the nationalization of all the instruments of production transport distribution and exchange private ownership of land of capital of warehouses of machinery of railways steamships canals tramways etc is to cease and industry is to be organized exclusively by the state it would be out of place to attempt here a critical examination of this or any other proposed solution of the economic problem of the nineteenth century but no history of the period can ignore either the insistent nature of the problem itself or the marked effect upon legislation and administration of the persistent effort to discover a solution the abandonment of the dogmas of the benthamite school the breakdown of the principle of laissez-faire the multiplication of governmental functions and the intrusion of the state into domains hitherto deemed sacred to the individual this has been for good or evil a marked feature of the latter portion of the period under review End of section one section two of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter one introductory part two the nineteenth century will however stand out not merely as the age of industry but as the age of science with the purely intellectual achievements of science this work cannot concern itself but no attempt however summary to estimate the forces which have gone to mould the destinies of modern england can fail to take account of the growth of the scientific spirit and the application of the scientific method science has not only permeated thought it has influenced legislation and has revolutionized the arts of production the whole mental outlook of the world has been profoundly modified by scientific generalizations the results of laboratory research are applied in the workshop and the steed of science is harnessed to the car of industry from science it is happily an easy transition to religion the ecclesiastical movement of the century seems to have followed three distinct but ultimately convergent directions it is expressed first in the successful agitation for the abolition of religious tests these tests were mainly the work of elizabethan and caroline statesmen 
and their object was to associate the state with the anglican establishment and to identify active citizenship with adherence to the church of england one of the most characteristic features of the legislation of the century has been the removal of the limitations thus imposed in illustration of this tendency it is sufficient to cite the repeal of the test and corporation acts eighteen twenty eight the catholic relief act eighteen twenty nine the admission of jews to parliament eighteen fifty eight the education act of eighteen seventy with its conscience clause and the act for the abolition of university tests eighteen seventy one it is not without significance that the surrender of a privileged political position by the church of england has been coincident with a period of remarkable activity within the borders of the church itself the earliest years of the century witnessed a great evangelical revival which derived its chief inspiration from cambridge the middle period was remarkable for the neo-catholic or tractarian movement which is particularly associated with oxford and later still the liberal or latitudinarian view found distinguished exponents in such men as f d morris arnold of rugby dean stanley and jowett closely connected with the last movement is the attempt now common to all schools of theology to apply the scientific and historical method to biblical interpretation and exegesis not less noteworthy is the fact that the age which witnessed the abolition of ecclesiastical tests witnessed also a complete change in the attitude of the state towards the education of the poor down to eighteen thirty three this was regarded as the exclusive concern of the churches not until that year did the state vouchsafe any assistance to the two great voluntary societies which were attempting to cope with this increasingly difficult problem in eighteen thirty nine a committee of the privy council was appointed to supervise the work of these societies not however for another generation did the state itself seriously undertake the function of educating the children of the poor and by that time its educational conscience had been aroused in other directions the appointment in eighteen fifty of two royal commissions to inquire into the state discipline studies and revenues of the universities of oxford and cambridge marks the real beginning of state interference with higher education the appointment of the public schools commission in eighteen sixty one and of lord Towton's commission in eighteen sixty four indicated similar concern as to secondary education these topics by no means exhaust the interest and significance of the victorian era constitutional economic social educational and ecclesiastical reforms must necessarily fill a large space in any volume devoted to the history of the nineteenth century but they must not be permitted to engage exclusive attention nor to obscure the importance of the part played by great britain upon the stage of european and world politics the revolution of sixteen eighty eight marked an important crisis in the relations of england and the continent and during the whole of the succeeding century sixteen eighty eight to eighteen fifteen this country played a conspicuous if not a dominating part the accession of the dutch stadtholder to the english throne the resounding victories of marlborough and rook the command of the mediterranean first asserted after the capture of gibraltar and minorca active participation in the so-called wars of succession spanish and austrian a long series of defeats inflicted upon france in three several continents above all the leadership of many coalitions in the revolutionary and napoleonic wars contributed to give to this country a pre-eminent position among the powers of europe 
but the essential significance of english activity during the period was missed by contemporary observers and for many generations by historical critics it may be an hyperbole to declare with sir john seeley that we conquered half the world in a fit of absence of mind nevertheless seeley performed a real historical service in teaching us to scrutinize motives and estimate broad results he reduced to order the chaos of the eighteenth century by showing that in the apparently disconnected and meaningless contests of that period there was a profound and consistent tendency and that events seemingly miscellaneous and unrelated were in reality making towards a definite and important goal that goal was colonial empire supremacy in india and the new world since eighteen fifteen the political focus has been consciously adjusted great britain has tended to withdraw from interference in matters which concern europe only and has concentrated her attention upon questions of world politics she has in fact exchanged a foreign for a colonial policy not one of the innumerable wars in which since eighteen fifteen she has been engaged was really european in significance and scope the one apparent exception the crimean war is an exception which strictly proves the rule she has fought in india in afghanistan in china in south africa in egypt in new zealand in canada in every quarter of the globe except in europe if the actual fighting in the crimean war took place on european soil it was the asiatic not the european interests of great britain which were immediately involved the moral of a bare recital such as this is unmistakable the centre of political gravity for the british empire has during the nineteenth century unquestionably shifted great britain can no longer be regarded primarily as a european power but as the mother of a bevy of daughter lands the president of an informal federation of free nations scattered throughout the world the pages that follow will disclose the growth of that empire its history falls to an extent not generally realized within the period allotted to this volume the great disruption of seventeen eighty three left us without any english colony save newfoundland and some of the west indian islands the history of british canada dates from the immigration of loyalists from the united states in seventeen eighty three but for many years the progress of the new colony was slow and in eighteen fifteen englishmen and frenchmen together numbered less than three hundred and fifty thousand souls cape colony had become by eighteen fifteen a british possession but not until eighteen twenty did it begin to be a british colony australia rediscovered by captain cook in seventeen sixty eight was utilized after the loss of the thirteen colonies as a penal settlement but not until eighteen twenty one was any part of it open to free immigration in india the foundation of a british empire had been laid broad and deep by clive and warren hastings in the eighteenth century and by eighteen fifteen much of the superstructure had been raised by cornwallis and wellesley but india though an imperial asset of supreme value never has been and never can be a british colony a field for the expansion and multiplication of the british race intimately connected with british domination in india is the position which this country has been compelled to assume in egypt british statesmen were however characteristically slow to realize the connection france perceived it long ago so far back as seventeen thirty eight a brilliant french diplomatist d'argenson published a project for the reorganization of the ottoman empire which included inter alia the acquisition of egypt by france and the cutting of a canal from the levant to the red sea which should belong in common to the whole world 
more than a century was to elapse before the idea of d'argenson was embodied in the great enterprise of lesseps it is however worthy of note that when in seventeen eighty eight the emperor joseph the second and the czarina catherine the second were meditating a partition of eastern europe they suggested that egypt should be thrown in as a sop to france at the close of the century napoleon determined that the acquisition of the sop should no longer be delayed in his campaign against great britain he realized from the outset that egypt was a vital point really to destroy england we must make ourselves master of egypt but england was curiously lethargic in awakening to the fact which loomed so large before the eyes of frenchmen in eighteen forty and again in eighteen fifty three nicholas i of russia pressed the question upon the attention of the english court and the english cabinet in his statesmanlike diagnosis of the eastern problem he invariably insisted that england's interests must be safeguarded by the acquisition of egypt but neither in eighteen forty nor in eighteen fifty three would england listen to the russian proposals based upon the recognition of this fact the opening of the suez canal in eighteen sixty nine revolutionized the situation the mediterranean which for four hundred years had been a mere backwater of commerce rapidly regained the position it had lost but the canal was the work not of england but of france in eighteen seventy five disraeli secured for england a controlling influence in the canal by the purchase of the khedive's shares it was a masterstroke of policy imperfectly appreciated at the moment and was followed up in eighteen seventy eight by the acquisition of cyprus at last england was awaking from her lethargy in regard to egypt the critical moment arrived in eighteen eighty two france declined to share in the task of the restoration of order the dual control was virtually abolished and the suppression of araby's rebellion was followed by the establishment of a thinly veiled british protectorate in eighteen eighty three in the same year troubles broke out in the soudan which after many vicissitudes and more than one tragedy was finally conquered in eighteen ninety eight apparently against the will and palpably against the initial inclination of the conqueror great britain has thus been compelled greatly to her own advantage and not less to the advantage of the people whom she rules to assume a dominant position in egypt and the soudan there remains one other topic which will demand detailed treatment in this volume the irish question is never very far from the surface of english politics ministries come and ministries go but the irish problem confronts them impartially when wellington won his victory at waterloo ireland was just midway between the union and catholic emancipation the catholic agitation was crowned with success in eighteen twenty nine and for ten years o'connell gave his whig allies their chance they failed to take it and in eighteen forty one the repeal agitation was inaugurated this culminated in the young ireland rebellion of eighteen forty eight but the central fact of irish history in the nineteenth century is the great famine of eighteen forty five to eighteen forty six it changed the face of the country and accentuated many problems which are still in process of solution among these the most insistent is the agrarian problem which with rare and short intervals occupied the attention of the imperial legislature from eighteen fifty until the close of the century during the sixties the agrarian movement was complicated by the fenian outbreak and by the successful agitation for the disestablishment and disendowment of the anglican church in ireland during the late seventies and throughout the eighties it was closely intertwined with the parnellite movement and the demand for legislative independence 
it is not pretended that the preceding analysis is in any sense exhaustive but in a period so crowded with detail it may perhaps conduce to lucidity if some emphasis is laid at the outset upon the main points to which in the pages that follow the reader's attention must be primarily directed perhaps we are as yet too near the events of the nineteenth century to see them in their true perspective or to assign to them the precise significance which in the eyes of posterity they will ultimately assume provisionally however we may hazard the conjecture that the characteristic differentia of english history since waterloo will be found in the conjoined ascendancy of science and industry in the advent of democracy and in the extension of empire end of section two section three of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two peace without plenty political economic and social dislocation eighteen fifteen to eighteen twenty two part one when wellington won his victory at waterloo the prince of wales had been for nearly five years regent of great britain and ireland after more than one temporary lapse into insanity george the third had finally been bereft of reason in eighteen ten and since then had lived in complete retirement at windsor under the guardianship of his devoted wife his eldest son now prince regent was perhaps the least reputable member of a family whose common stock of virtue was not superabundant by no means devoid of ability not lacking in dignity and possessed of considerable personal charm he had nevertheless deservedly forfeited the affection and even the respect of his people for the vindictiveness with which he pursued his wife there may have been reason but nothing can excuse his undutiful behaviour to his father or his harshness toward his only legitimate child a shameless voluptuary a reckless spendthrift a hard drinker and a confirmed gambler his conduct was a constant embarrassment to his ministers and a terrible example to his subjects but his correspondence with the leading statesman of the time proves that he had an ample measure of political sagacity and no little shrewdness in his judgment of men he had received the allied sovereigns in eighteen fourteen with a dignity and hospitality worthy of a unique occasion and his visits to ireland in eighteen twenty one and scotland in eighteen twenty two afforded evidence of his power to conciliate goodwill when he chose to exert himself to that end but it cannot be denied that the crown lost both political power and social prestige during his reign as regent and king the prince's early attachment to the whigs had sensibly cooled since his accession to a position of greater responsibility and although he had opened negotiations with their aristocratic leaders in eighteen twelve he was probably relieved when the overtures proved sterile on spencer percival's death in eighteen twelve the premiership together with the leadership of the tory party had passed to lord liverpool robert banks jenkinson second earl of liverpool belongs to a class of statesmen whom we are pleased to regard as typically english born in seventeen seventy and educated at the charter house in christchurch he entered parliament as member for rye in seventeen ninety he served his official apprenticeship under pitt and his administrative experience was exceptionally large and various before his accession to the premiership he had filled all three secretaryships of state at the foreign office under addington he was responsible for the treaty of amiens he was at the home office under pitt from eighteen o four to eighteen o six and again 
under the Duke of Portland from 1807 to 1809, and as secretary for the colonies and war from 1809 to 1812, he was immediately responsible for the conduct of the war in the peninsula. He was not included in the Ministry of All the Talents, but he was regarded, particularly by the King, as more than a possible candidate for the Premiership in 1807, and again when Percival was preferred to him in 1809. After Percival's assassination, there were prolonged negotiations with Wellesley and Canning on the one side, and with the Whig leaders Grenville Grey and Moira on the other. Ultimately, however, Lord Liverpool formed a government which differed little in personnel from that of his predecessor. Selected as a safe compromise in 1812, Lord Liverpool succeeded in retaining office with satisfaction to his friends and the goodwill of his opponents for no less than fifteen years. That he was ever in the front rank of English statesmen no one will affirm, but he was an admirable administrator. He filled the highest offices in the state with dignity and efficiency. He spoke with lucidity and good sense. He was conciliatory to his opponents, and he held together his own party as no one else at that time could have done. Of Lord Liverpool's colleagues, the most prominent were the Lord Chancellor, and the secretaries of state for foreign and home affairs john scott first earl of eldon was throughout his political life a consistent and unbending tory of the deepest hue the younger of two remarkable brothers he entered the house of commons through the good offices of lord thurlow in seventeen eighty two he became solicitor general in pitt's administration in seventeen eighty eight attorney in 1793, chief justice of the common pleas in 1799, and lord chancellor under Addington in 1801. He held that office until after Pitt's death in 1806. To the grief of the king he refused to be associated with all the talents, but he returned to the Woolsack under Portland in 1807, and for twenty years never quitted it. Despite former differences, he enjoyed the confidence of the regent, not less completely than that of George III, and to the end of his life was the typical representative of that school of Toryism which detested the idea of change or reform. Far inferior to the Chancellor in ability, but belonging to the same school of Toryism, was the Home Secretary Lord Sidmouth. Canning's merciless lampoons have tended to obscure the substantial merits of Dr. Addington. An admirable speaker of the House of Commons, Addington was dragged in 1801 from a position he adorned to occupy one to which he was manifestly unequal. But though he could not fill Pitt's shoes as premier, Addington was by no means the fool that contemporary satire would suggest. As Home Secretary during the critical years, 1812 to 1821, he must at least have the credit of having performed an exceedingly unpopular duty with unflinching courage and exemplary firmness. Whether he was statesman enough to comprehend causes as well as to deal vigorously with effects is a matter of dispute on which something must presently be said incomparably more interesting as a personality than either Sidmouth or Eldon, was the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Robert Stuart, Viscount Castlereagh. That contemporaries should have undervalued his merits and achievements is not perhaps remarkable, for Castlereagh, with all his splendid endowments of character and intellect, was entirely lacking in personal magnetism. Stately in quiet, high-bred self-esteem, fair as the loveless of a lady's dream. Lord Lytton's lines do no more than justice to his remarkable dignity. But he had none of the arts which make for general popularity. 
himself devoid of enthusiasm and too honest to affect a quality he did not possess, he naturally failed to evoke it among his followers. He is, said Cornwallis, so cold that nothing can warm him. The very qualities which gave him his ascendancy in the councils of Europe militated against his success in the British Senate. His calm, unruffled, and passionless judgment commanded the respect of continental diplomatists. His curious lack of oratorical skill invited the sarcasm of his parliamentary opponents. But his special misfortune was that throughout his career he should have been overshadowed in popular estimation by the brilliant gifts of his great rival Canning and posterity has been slow to correct the misapprehension of contemporaries. For a quarter of a century, Castlereagh played an important part in English politics. For ten years, he was the real ruler of England and one of the arbiters of Europe. As chief secretary for Ireland, he was largely responsible for the suppression of the rebellion and mainly instrumental in carrying the act of union. He was Secretary of State for the Colonies and War under Pitt in 1805, and again under Portland from 1807 to 1809. But his real work was done at the Foreign Office, and it is by his ten years' administration of that great department that his reputation must stand or fall coming into office at a moment, 1812, when Napoleon's power, though threatened, was still unbroken. It was his task to maintain the European coalition during the most critical years of the whole war and to represent Great Britain in the negotiations for peace. He reached the zenith of his fame as a statesman in the year of Waterloo. The last seven years of his life, with which alone we are concerned in this volume, were not only an anticlimax in his career, they added much to his contemporary unpopularity, and they detracted seriously, though perhaps unjustly, from his posthumous fame. Such were the men to whom at a critical time the destinies of the country were confided. The task before them was one of appalling complexity. They were called upon immediately and simultaneously to restore equilibrium to the national finances, to relieve the pressure of taxation, to enter upon the gigantic task of liquidating the national debt, to alleviate distress, and to maintain social order and all this at a moment of slackening trade and diminishing revenue. Rarely indeed, if ever, in our history has social discontent been more pronounced or economic distress more general than in the years immediately following upon the peace of 1815. For this there were many reasons. A proverbial aphorism associates peace with plenty, experience teaches, on the contrary, that the conclusion of a great war is invariably followed by a period of suffering and want. But never has the economic recoil of peace been so marked as in the years between 1815 and 1822. For this fact, the duration and severity of the struggle which ended at Waterloo would alone be sufficient to account. But all the effects of protracted war were, in this case, accentuated by the coincidence of an economic revolution without parallel or precedent in magnitude and scope. During the long war a New England had come into being, and it is hardly matter for surprise that rulers and ruled were alike distracted by the phenomenon that they were slow to diagnose the unfamiliar diseases of the body politic, and slower still to devise appropriate remedies. When the French Republic declared war upon Great Britain in 1793, it had at its back a population of over 26 million souls. To oppose to this, 
the united kingdom could command perhaps fourteen million people of whom a discontented ireland claimed between three and four million by eighteen fifteen the population of the united kingdom despite the drain of the war had leaped up to nineteen million an increase of thirty five per cent in twenty two years such an increase was without precedent in this country before seventeen fifty one it is believed that the largest decennial increase of population was about three per cent between seventeen ninety one and eighteen o one it was eleven per cent between eighteen o one and eighteen eleven fourteen per cent and between eighteen eleven and eighteen twenty one no less than eighteen per cent well might the benevolent malthus be alarmed this phenomenal increase in population was due to the coincidence of prolonged war and economic revolution there was a simultaneous demand for men for the arts of war and the arts of commerce artificial stimulus was followed by corresponding depression with the peace came a secession of demand both for men and for commodities and the market was suddenly glutted this phenomenon was neither unnatural nor unprecedented but in this case industrial dislocation was intensified by the peculiar conditions of the recent war for the last twenty years england had been the only country in western europe free from the devastating effects of military operations she had consequently been called upon to supply the commercial needs of the whole world and thanks to the recent improvements in agriculture and in manufacturing industry she was in a position to do so the result was seen in a totally unprecedented expansion of foreign trade in seventeen ninety two the total imports amounted to nineteen million six hundred and fifty nine thousand three hundred and fifty eight pounds and the exports to eighteen million three hundred and thirty six thousand eight hundred and fifty one pounds in the last year of war imports rose to thirty two million nine hundred and eighty seven thousand three hundred and ninety six pounds while the exports reached the amazing total of fifty eight million six hundred and twenty four thousand five hundred and fifty pounds but england had not merely secured a virtual monopoly of manufactures she had also become the carrier of the world since napoleon's famous berlin decree and the british retort embodied in the orders in council no ship could sail the seas except under the british flag the extent to which england had become the entrepot of international trade may be gauged by the statistics of foreign and colonial produce re-exported from this country re-exports which in the last year of the peace seventeen ninety two amounted to six million five hundred and sixty eight thousand three hundred and forty nine pounds rose in the last year of war to nineteen million one hundred and fifty seven thousand eight hundred and eighteen pounds the national resources kept pace with the expansion of trade and the growth of population the revenue collected by pitt in seventeen ninety two amounted to no more than nineteen million eight hundred and fifty nine thousand one hundred and twenty three pounds the same taxes produced in the last year of the war no less than forty five million pounds but these taxes were of course wholly inadequate to the service of the state during the twenty-three years between seventeen ninety three and eighteen fifteen over sixty five million pounds a year was on the average raised for public purposes and during the last two years the expenditure reached the appalling total of one hundred and five million nine hundred and forty three thousand seven hundred and twenty seven pounds for eighteen thirteen and one hundred and six million eight hundred and thirty two thousand two hundred and sixty pounds for eighteen fourteen an heroic effort was made 
to meet expenses as far as possible out of revenue. Thus, while in 1793 the tax revenue was, we have seen, about £20 million, by 1815 it had risen to £72,210,512, the largest sum ever raised by taxation in Great Britain until the Crimean War. But no modern state could have carried on the Napoleonic War, still less have sustained by lavish subsidies an European coalition without recourse to loans. Hence the charge for debt, interest, and management, which in 1793 amounted to less than £9,500,000, had swollen by 1815 to over thirty-one million pounds. The capital sum of the debt had increased in an even more appalling degree, from two hundred and thirty-nine million six hundred and sixty-three thousand four hundred and twenty-one pounds in the former year to eight hundred thirty-one million one hundred and seventy-one thousand one hundred and thirty-two pounds in the latter. Opinions differ as to the policy of Pitt and his successors at the Treasury in raising the loans required in stock of a low denomination, but on the whole, the system is generally condemned. Between 1793 and 1801, the average rate at which 3% stock was issued was £57, 7 shillings, 6 pence per 100 pounds of stock. Between 1803 and 1815, the average price obtained was sixty pounds seven shillings sixpence. Had the financiers of that day had the courage to raise money at something more nearly approaching the market price, say five per cent, the burden upon the shoulders of posterity would have been sensibly lightened, and the sacrifices demanded of contemporaries not appreciably increased. Those sacrifices could not, under any circumstances, have been otherwise than heavy. Nevertheless, during the greater part of the war, they were sustained with remarkable cheerfulness. Employment was abundant, trade was advancing by leaps and bounds, high prices diffused an air of general, if delusive, prosperity, but during the last five years of the struggle the economic outlook darkened ominously. The rigors of the continental system and the British retaliations began to tell. War with the United States from 1812 to 1814 still further dislocated trade, while in Great Britain itself several bad harvests caused the price of wheat to fluctuate violently. Between 1803 and 1813 the average price of wheat was over five pounds a quarter, and in the summer of 1813 it touched 171 shillings. Before Christmas of the same year it had dropped to 75 shillings. Among many causes which contributed to high prices and still more to violent fluctuations, one deserves special mention. Since the crisis of 1797, cash payments had been suspended at the Bank of England, and an enforced paper currency had been in circulation. As a consequence, innumerable country banks had sprung up, some of them reared upon very unstable foundations. Between 1797 and 1814, more than 700 such banks came into existence, but more than a third of them stopped payment in the critical years 1814 and 1815. Inflation of the paper currency naturally followed upon the suspension of cash payments and the multiplication of banks. But until the closing years of the war, the effects were less marked than might have been anticipated. In 1810, there were 25 million pounds of notes in circulation, and the premium on gold rose to 8 pounds 7 shillings 8 pence per cent. In 1813, it rose to twenty nine pounds four shillings one pence, and the gold value of a five pound note fell to three pounds ten shillings. In eighteen fifteen, the premium fell to thirteen pounds nine shillings sixpence, and the gold value of a five pound note rose consequently to four pounds six shillings. 
in the face of such violent fluctuations no prudence could avert commercial ruin trade was reduced to a mere gamble and violent oscillations in prices inflicted dire hardship alike upon producer retailer and consumer it may be doubted however whether amongst all the factors which contributed to the prevailing misery there was any single one so potent as the mistaken kindness which inspired the administrators of the poor law the first half of the eighteenth century is one of the bright periods in the history of english pauperism when george the third came to the throne the total sum expended on the relief of the poor amounted to no more than one million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds or three shillings seven pence per head of the population the last twenty years of the century witnessed the legislative abolition of the workhouse test and a sensible slackening in the strictness of administration the example of the berkshire magistrates who in seventeen ninety five decided to supplement wages out of the rates was so generally followed throughout the south of england as to elevate the resolution of a local bench to the dignity of an act of parliament the notorious speenhamland act contained an elaborate schedule by which income was to be apportioned to family the policy embodied in this act has been vigorously assailed and cannot on economic grounds be defended it stimulated population it encouraged idleness it depressed wages and it rendered still harder the hard lot of the thrifty and independent labourer the seed flung carelessly broadcast at the close of the eighteenth century produced an abundant harvest of demoralization and misery in the second and third decades of the nineteenth the cost of poor relief had risen to eight shillings eleven pence per head in eighteen o three and thirteen shillings one pence in eighteen eleven the annual expenditure on poor relief which in the first year of george the third's reign was one million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds averaged during the last five years of the reign over seven million pounds and the economic burden was perhaps the least of the evils this expenditure entailed such were the outstanding features of the situation by which the rulers of england were confronted after the conclusion of the great war a labour market congested and dislocated trade suddenly arrested after a period of abnormal inflation a gigantic debt a falling revenue a disordered currency a peasantry demoralized by reckless administration of relief a populace discontented and ripe for disturbance all classes involved in a common ruin landlord and tenant farmer capitalist and manufacturer banker and merchant skilled artisan and agricultural laborer to those who can attribute all the prevailing misery to the fatuous policy of a selfish oligarchy the above analysis will seem superfluously elaborate to those who refuse to accept this facile explanation and desire to trace surface effects to underlying causes it may be helpful certain it is that without a clear apprehension of the social and economic situation in eighteen fifteen there can be no fair criticism of the policy pursued by the government of the day and no real clue to the complex problems by which they were confronted under these circumstances it was singularly unfortunate that lord liverpool should have committed the exchequer to van sittert despite some financial experience and much personal amiability he was obviously unequal to the office at a time of almost unparalleled responsibility he had neither a strong grip on economic principles nor sufficient business ability to atone for the lack of it muddle-headed as a thinker he was blundering as an administrator the leading dogma of his economic creed was a blind belief in the virtues of irredeemable paper money 
the chief plank in his financial program was the maintenance of the sinking fund even at the cost of fresh loans in the budget of eighteen sixteen van sittert had to provide for an expenditure of over sixty six million pounds apart from the property tax which stood at two shillings in the pound and yielded about fifteen million pounds a year he could reckon on receipts of over fifty eight million pounds he proposed therefore to reduce the property tax to one shilling but the opposition regarded this as a very imperfect fulfilment of repeated pledges and raised a strong protest broom whose brilliant parliamentary career dates from this time led the attack upon van sittert with extraordinary persistency and skill like his nominal leaders ponsonby and tierney broom refused the proffered remission of one shilling and demanded that as the war was over the war tax should be altogether abandoned the government was beaten by a majority of thirty-seven and van sittert deprived of his expected seven million five hundred thousand pounds was faced with a large deficit defeated on the property tax he decided to surrender as well the war malt tax an additional two shillings per bushel on malt imposed in eighteen o four this concession cost him an additional two million seven hundred thousand pounds even under these circumstances the sinking fund was sacrosanct and van sittert solved his problems by borrowing eleven million five hundred thousand pounds with one hand while he paid fifteen million pounds into the sinking fund with the other such scrupulosity might be magnificent but it was not sound finance the year eighteen sixteen is nevertheless memorable for a financial transaction of permanent significance ireland had become to all intents and purposes insolvent and it was decided that the only permanent solution of her difficulties was to be found in the consolidation of the british and irish exchequers this natural sequel to pitt's political union was actually consummated in january eighteen seventeen and conferred an immense though unappreciated boon upon the poorer country for great britain as a whole the outlook was exceedingly gloomy but the clouds were momentarily dispelled by the auspicious marriage of the princess charlotte and the success which attended the naval expedition to algiers on may second eighteen sixteen the princess charlotte augusta heiress to the throne and the only legitimate grandchild of george the third was married to prince leopold georg frederick younger brother of the reigning duke of saxe coburg her refusal to marry william prince of orange foiled castlereagh's favourite project but it did not diminish her general popularity and her marriage to prince leopold was heartily acclaimed by those who hoped at no distant date to be her subjects the house of commons voted sixty thousand pounds for the princess's trousseau and settled sixty thousand pounds a year upon her in august lord exmouth was dispatched in command of a large naval force to chastise the day of algiers for a recent outrage upon the british flag and to compel him to abandon the practice of christian slavery the naval operations were conducted with brilliant success the objects of the expedition were completely attained and a death-blow was given to the barbarous and piratical custom of reducing captives to slavery marriage bells and brilliant feats of arms might temporarily relieve but they could not permanently dissipate the prevailing gloom bad harvests and violent fluctuations of prices were bringing widespread ruin upon agriculturists in the hope of assisting them the legislature in eighteen fifteen prohibited the importation of wheat until the price reached eighty shillings a quarter but this afforded no relief when as in eighteen sixteen the price fell to fifty-two shillings sixpence it is easy to blame farmers for their folly in taking leases at rents calculated upon war prices 
and to condemn landlords for extortion. But meanwhile the greatest of English industries appeared to be threatened with imminent ruin. Reports received by the Board of Agriculture in response to a circular letter issued in 1816 attest the severity of the crisis. Farmers who a few years ago were competing eagerly for farms were sending in notices to quit, and many farms were unlet. Mortgagees found it difficult to realize. Credit was collapsing. Banks were failing in all directions. Substantial farmers were becoming parish paupers. And while the producer was ruined, the consumer derived no benefit. In December 1816, wheat, which in the spring had fallen to 52 shillings sixpence, rose to 103 shillings. Agriculture had become a mere gamble. If landlords and farmers were ruined, merchants and manufacturers were in no better plight. The citizens, wrote the master of the mint, have lost all their feelings of pride and richness and flourishing fatness. Trade is gone, contracts are gone, paper credit is gone, and there is nothing but stoppage, retrenchments, and bankruptcy. Wellesley Pole did not exaggerate the gravity of the situation, nor are the causes of it obscure. The war, as we have seen, had encouraged reckless capital expenditure. Traders, as is their wont, looked no further than their noses. The inevitable happened. With the restoration of normal conditions, the continental demand for English goods rapidly slackened, prices came down with a run, production was paralyzed, and thousands of hands were turned adrift to swell the army of the unemployed. The crisis was particularly severe in the industries which had been stimulated by the demand for war stores. The iron and coal trades were especially depressed. Out of 34 furnaces in South Staffordshire, 24 were out of blast, and whole villages were reduced to starvation. Similar stories came from Newport, Tredegar, Mertir Tidwell, and other growing towns of Monmouthshire and South Wales, whilst thousands of iron workers and colliers were suddenly thrown out of work. The natural consequences ensued. As William Coppet himself observed, when men are in distress, they are out of humor. They have not time and are not in a disposition to listen to reason. Because bread was at famine prices, the existing supplies of corn were diminished by incendiaries. Because work was scarce, machinery was smashed and factories were destroyed. From all parts of the country came reports of violence and crime. In the eastern counties there was an alarming amount of unrest and disorder. Barns and ricks were burnt to the ground, thrashing machines and other agricultural implements were publicly burned, Bakers' and butchers' shops were attacked, and angry mobs demanded bread or blood. Cargoes of wheat and potatoes intended for export were seized. Immense damage was inflicted upon property, and Littleport, in the Isle of Ely, presented the appearance of a town sacked by a besieging army. Nor was the unrest confined to the agricultural counties. The Tyneside colliers, the Preston cotton weavers, the Wiltshire cloth workers, the Monmouthshire and Staffordshire iron workers, the jute workers of Dundee, all alike were in ferment, demanding more employment, higher wages, and cheaper food. The agitation was not exclusively economic. It began to assume a political complexion. With the cries for more work and cheaper food, there began to mingle demands for universal suffrage and annual parliaments. Demagogues like Orator Hunt, brilliant pamphleteers like William Cobbett, added fuel to the flames, and Byron exhausted his powers of mordant sarcasm in pouring contempt upon the government. Cobbett's political register was, at the end of 1816, reduced in price from one shilling to tuppence, and began to exercise an unbounded political influence. Political clubs sprang up like mushrooms. The Hampton Clubs, founded by Major Cartwright in 1815, began to formulate 
many of the demands afterwards embodied in the charter the spencian philanthropists preached communistic doctrines to hungry mobs in the background we can discern the more sinister figures of political conspirators and even assassins men of the type of the watsons and thistlewood in the winter of eighteen sixteen london itself was alarmed by an outbreak of disorder on november fifteenth a meeting was organized in spa fields bermondsey to call attention to the sufferings of the distressed manufacturers artisans and others of the cities of london and westminster the borough of southwark and parts adjacent and after much wild talk was adjourned to december second rumors gained ground of an organized attack upon the government of plots to seize the tower and the bank and to seduce the army undoubtedly there was much inflammatory language mobs assembled bearing tricolor badges and men talked of a committee of public safety on december second the adjourned meeting was held in spa fields the mob inflamed by speeches from the watsons made off to clerkenwell and smithfield sacked a gunsmith's shop at snow hill and armed with their booty marched through cheapside and invaded the royal exchange courageously confronted by matthew wood the lord mayor their further progress was arrested and after some time order was restored but behind the mob serious political forces were in operation precisely a week after the spa fields meeting the corporation of london formally addressed the prince regent they declared that the distress and misery which for so many years has been progressively accumulating has at length become insupportable and that the commercial the manufacturing and the agricultural interests are equally sinking under its irresistible pressure and it has become impossible to find employment for a large mass of the population they ascribed the distress and discontent to rash and ruinous wars unjustly commenced and pertinaciously persisted in to gross extravagance in the war and peace and above all to the corrupt and inadequate state of the representation of the people in parliament they begged the regent to urge upon parliament measures for making every practicable reduction in the public expenditure and restoring to the people their just share and weight in the legislature the prince regent did not add to his popularity by the severe snub which he inflicted upon the petitioners and as he returned from the opening of parliament january twenty eighth eighteen seventeen the windows of his coach were smashed on the reassembling of parliament ministers were confronted by a menacing situation political agitation was clearly supervening upon the social disorder arising from economic distress would it under these circumstances be wise or even possible to embark upon the path of reform might not concession be interpreted as weakness was it not imperative to begin with the restoration of social order but would not repression drive the moderates into the arms of the extremists the secure wisdom of posterity may suggest that the way of safety lay in a judicious combination of strong administration and timely reform but such a policy would have demanded a precise diagnosis of the situation no ministry could safely plunge into the sea of reform without previously ascertaining the strength and direction of the currents and cross-currents they would have to encounter was the country ripening for revolution would reform arrest or precipitate it were the sporadic outbreaks of disorder due to the intolerable pressure of economic distress or evidences of a settled design to overturn the existing order such were the questions confronting the executive and no fair-minded critic will be quick to blame lord liverpool and his colleagues if they were not answered with the assurance and wisdom which come only with a knowledge of the event the prince regent's speech at the opening of parliament january twenty eighth referred to the attempts which have been made to take advantage of the distresses of the country 
for the purpose of exciting a spirit of sedition and violence secret committees were immediately appointed in both houses and on february eighteenth and nineteenth their reports were laid before parliament the committees after an investigation of the information at the disposal of the executive were clearly impressed with the gravity of the situation they held that both in london and in the provinces notably in the manufacturing districts of lancashire leicestershire derby nottingham and glasgow there was clear evidence of a deliberately planned revolutionary movement they deplored the multiplication of political clubs and societies and the dissemination of inflammatory publications which not only demanded advanced political reforms such as universal suffrage and annual elections but aimed at the plunder and division of all property which taught that the landowner was a monster to be hunted down and that worse than the landowners were the fund holders rapacious creatures who take from the people fifteen pence out of every quartern loaf in view of these reports sidmouth and castlereagh had little difficulty in persuading parliament to suspend the habeas corpus act for four months march third through july first and to pass further acts to prohibit the holding of seditious meetings to prevent the seduction of the army and navy from their allegiance and to provide for the security of the regent's person more keenly criticized was a letter issued by lord sidmouth to the lord lieutenants march twenty seventh urging the magistrates to issue warrants for the apprehension of persons charged before them upon oath with the publication of blasphemous and seditious pamphlets and writings and to compel them to give bail to answer the charge the circular was regarded as an insidious attack upon the liberty of the press and though prosecutions were numerous convictions were few the most notorious and damaging fiasco was the prosecution on december eighteenth of an antiquarian bookseller named hone who had published certain profane parodies such as the sinecurist's creed despite the efforts of the attorney-general and chief justice ellenborough to secure a conviction hone induced the jury to acquit him and the popularity of the verdict was unmistakable meanwhile agitation was renewed in the north and midlands early in march large meetings of working men organized in manchester were dispersed by the authorities and on march twenty ninth some thousands of the agitators set out upon a journey to london which from the fact that the men carried blankets is known as the march of the blanketeers the march was arrested and the men dispersed before they had got many miles out of manchester more serious but still abortive was an insurrection planned by a man named brandreth in the midlands on june tenth some alarm was created by the march of armed rioters in derbyshire and nottingham but the rioters were easily dispersed by the yeomanry and ringleaders were arrested and paid for their criminal folly with their lives in consequence of these renewed disturbances secret committees were again appointed june third in both houses and the committees found but too many proofs of the continued existence of a traitorous conspiracy for the overthrow of our established government and constitution and for the subversion of the existing order of society before the prorogation parliament renewed until march first eighteen eighteen the suspension of the habeas corpus act end of section three